This is George Dion of the Rock is George podcast, and this is a KNAC.com exclusive interview with vocalist Dan Cleary of the Canadian heavy metal act Stryker. If I knew absolutely nothing about Stryker, how would you describe the band's music to me? Um, I guess I would describe it as um, sort of a mix of traditional heavy metal, classic heavy metal with um, a bit more modern production and then some modern influences thrown in here and there. Something like that. I say that's pretty accurate. You guys are getting ready to release your seventh studio album ultra power you started a you started a kickstarter campaign you reached your goal within five days you exceeded your goal by about five thousand american dollars um this must be a little bit humbling for you guys yeah it's been great um we we sort of decided to do the kickstarter approach because we're an independent band um in the past We've done like pre-order campaigns and stuff like that, but we felt that you know we had a a couple friends bands do a similar thing and did really well, so uh, we thought we'd give it a give it a try. So far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I also noticed that you've worked with labels in the past. Did you just not like what they had to offer and felt that you should go independent at some juncture? Uh yeah we we had been working with Napalm Records uh, and then we released our second album with them. And then just after that decided that we'd give it a try doing the independent thing. Um, I think there's a lot of good things that labels do, but I think at the time when we were working with uh, that label, we, we didn't really know what we were in for. Like we weren't sure how the whole thing worked, right? Like you go in fairly naive when you're a young band and you're just like, Oh yeah, this will be great. They'll do this, 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 everything for us. And then, the, the hard reality is that you still have to work really hard on your band, no matter what's, you know, a label won't just uh, shoot you off into space. Or, you know, it's all comes down to, you know, your own work you put in. And we figured, hey, if we're going to put in all this work, like we may as well see a bit more of the reward, I guess. <laughs> sure, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh- Ultra Power is kind of the largest gap you guys have had in between albums. Your album Play to Win came out in 2018. Uh, was there something that's been holding up this album along the way besides a worldwide? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, uh, besides getting steamrolled by COVID. Um, yeah, it was interesting because we were like, like right when COVID hit, we were thinking like, what should we do? And then we, we did record a few singles, um, but that was sort of like a, a turbulent time for the band, just like internally also, not just, the, I mean, I would say that the COVID break had a lot to do with that as well. But um, yeah, so the band sort of fell apart in the middle of COVID and then sort of, you know, after a while, we're like, actually being in a band is sick, so we want to keep doing it. And uh, so we got our shit together and finally got in the studio and recorded well when you don't know whether you're gonna live or die and the world's gonna go to shit i mean yeah you might be reconsidering (laughs) still being a band yeah like (laughs) is this the most important thing going on right now it's like uh... but yeah once everything kind of settled it was uh pretty obvious to us that we still wanted to keep playing music so you have an interesting choice for producer for ultra power you brought in josh schroeder he's known for Deathcore, which really wasn't in your description of uh, Striker when I asked you, he's known for producing acts like Lorna Shore. Um, what may you normally produce your own albums? Why did you reach out to Josh? Uh, it's funny. So, just like going back into like the history of like our influences, I mean, early on, obviously Iron Maiden, stuff like that, uh, Juice Priest, and then. Uh, sort of as time's gone by, like we've, we've been really in the early days, we were very much against new, new metal, like almost any new releases. We were like, ah, it's like, if it wasn't from like the eighties, we weren't really listening to it. But, uh, you know, eventually we sort of, you know, you get a little older and you, you start to lose that like elitism that you had once upon a time. And then, uh, I, I don't know, like personally, I started getting into a lot of, I had a friend at work who started showing me some, 
some death core and that kind of thing. And I was like, man, this is some pretty crazy stuff. And at first it's sort of like a joke, right? You listen to it and you're like, oh, this is, you know, it's so crazy and it's just funny. And then, and then after a while you're like, actually, I kind of like that. And it's, it's sort of like anything, any kind of extreme music. It, it, the first time you hear it, you're kind of like, that's way too much. And then you keep going back to it and you're like, oh, that's actually, I kind of like that. So we, we just thought it would be fun, like a fun experiment to go and work with a producer who who does, or at least is most well known for working with deathcore artists, and and just see what happens. I know what you mean about the the extreme sound. I remember the first time I heard Cradle of Filth. I'm like, nah, this is terrible. This is never going to work. That high pitched <laughs> wail. Is it? And then the more I listen to it, I'm like, you know what? It's not bad actually. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, um, they talk about uh, like lifestyle creep it's like the more money you make the more you spend it's sort of like a extreme creep it's like the more extreme it gets the more you listen you know it's like that kind of thing <laughs> now was josh surprised that you reached out to him yeah i think so he was like he was on board right away like we uh, we you know we sent him like links to our previous stuff and he was just like immediate. I, I mean, he's a really interesting guy. Like he's very creative. So he was immediately like, I would love to try this. Like, you know, and I mean, he's a, he's of that world too. I mean, he grew up, you know, he's a little bit older than us, but not, a, not a lot. So he was around for all the same styles of music that we were interested in. So it's like, you know, just because his modern approach is like for this type of band he's you know he's still a huge fan of all kinds of music so he was he was excited to work with us which was great for us you've released a song in advance of the album called the best of the best of the best and you didn't go full deathcore so that's positive no. <laughs> but certainly a slight more intensity in your music i'd say for sure yeah i think that's the main thing i don't know it i i think it's funny i mean we're like sort of playing it off like there's going to be a ton of like crazy breakdowns and stuff it's not really like that i mean i think uh josh as a producer a big thing for him is to is to bring out the best in the band which is any any good producer that's their goal right this to um sort of just bring what the band is to its full realization and uh yeah i think he did that with us a lot i i really think like um for me particularly uh the vocals recording in a studio it's so it's so easy to record at home and you just you kind of like take your time with it and you're just like ah you know it's like i could try the same line as many times as i want and and it's nice to have a a producer there saying like what's what's the lyric like why are you singing this you know that kind of thing to sort of get more emotion and more so there's some like there's a lot more grit and like you know just i think a better performance in general vocally on the album which was uh super rewarding for me i was really happy with that so the music video for the best of the best of the best uh you guys certainly look like you're having fun there you're out on jet skis you're out playing the guitar in some weird places and whatnot yeah yeah it's it's fun man we we uh i, I mean these days i don't know what people are looking for in a music video so for us we're just like you know how many music videos exist even just in metal it's like Oh, like a, a couple thousand a year come out at least like i mean it's all been done before so we just figure like we're just having fun with it it's uh a good excuse to blow the budget on renting some jet skis and stuff like that so yeah it, it's better than those um videos where everybody's in a different location in in a dark room and then they just marry them together yeah yeah <laughs> we try and do something a little different than that i mean that's the that's the easy way out i think <laughs> You mentioned recording in a studio. Uh, you guys rented an Airbnb for about a month or so. Uh, where did you have to relocate to record at the studio? Uh, that was down in, in Midland, Michigan. And uh, it, it felt like home, really. Like there was lots of snow. <laughs> like, it was, we were sort of thinking like, okay, we're going to go to the studio. Um, and, you know, there's all those old Iron Maiden documentaries where they're, they're going to compass point which is in like the bahamas and then we went to like sort of middle of nowhere michigan in the snow it was like which is probably for the best i mean 
I think we were a bit more focused because there was less distractions. There really wasn't a lot to do. So we're just kind of like go to the Airbnb, hang out, like drink some beers and then go back in the morning to the studio. So was this your first time recording an album in a studio? I uh, know we've actually it's funny we've we've gone to a sort of a, a strange collection of producers in the past so we um for our second album we worked with Michael Wagner in Nashville which is he's obviously Skid Row Metallica like he, his list of bands is crazy and that was one of those things where we sent an email just being like there's no way you know we're like we have an album but you know so we sent like a demo song and and he was like, yeah, I'd love to do this. And we were like, no way. And we were like, now we got to figure out how to pay for it. <laughs> like, holy shit. <laughs> but, um, and then we went to record with uh, Frederick Nordstrom in Sweden, which was an interesting time. Spent like, uh, yeah, four weeks, four or five weeks in Sweden. Um, and that was an interesting one because they had bunks built into the studio and stuff. So it's like bands could come and, and stay in the studio so that was a bit of an interesting trip, but uh, so yeah, some some sort sort of different styles of producers. We got the uh, hundred million albums producer, uh, our S Swedish death metal producer, and then now our our uh, American actually well technically he's Canadian, but living in America, uh, deathcore producer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, even though you've reached your goal on Kickstarter, it's still live. You got a bunch of rewards that typically comes with a Kickstarter campaign, CD versions of the album, vinyl versions where people will get their name on the inlays. Uh, I saw one that, you know, you can chuck on a, you're going to chuck on a beer for a, a donation. Uh, whose idea was this? Uh, so we, we actually did the same idea on the, I, th I think it was a play to win pre-order it was like if you got the um you know like the complete bundle of the shirt the vinyl and whatever we would also do um a, a shotgun tribute basically we just shotgun a beer and and you know do it on video and uh you know say hello to the person or whatever and then we posted them all on youtube but it ended up being like um we sold a lot of them because it was it was combined with the uh um with that like bundle so we ended up having to do a lot of them in a row and it's like i mean shotgunning one beer that's you know it's not too bad but we did like f f i think it was five or six one night because it was like we all wanted to be together and we don't always you know it's hard to get everybody all, all the time so it's like we do a rehearsal and then we're like okay we got to shoot the shotgun videos and it was just like yeah like five or six in a row and you're just like oh my god that's there's only so much foam you can put in your well, from what I understand, my editor here at KNAC brings you guys beer every time you come through Texas, so you must have a decent supply of beer to do these shotguns. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. We've been, a, a you know, like a beer band for a while, and uh, I mean, that's so unique as a metal band, right? But <laughs> um, we've had lots of lots of fans and friends uh, bring us, especially like local local craft beers and things like that on tour and it's always it's always super nice to get um because usually what you're supplied with is you know the most basic beer you can get some lone star or something <laughs> i don't know if that's basic but <laughs> i've played clubs trust me and when they paid us in beer it wasn't the good stuff yeah you get <laughs> two two pitchers for three bands or whatever that <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly uh, also within these uh, rewards on Kickstarter, um, you you'll have the person that made the purchase appear on your podcast. You do a video shout out. You give them an executive producer credit if they go high enough in the rewards things. Uh, you'll cover a song for them. You'll write a song with one of them. That could have disastrous results, I think. <laughs> There's got to be some stipulations. That's what I thought, too. I was like, oh, man uh we'll see and it's it's interesting we haven't actually had anybody get that one yet but um uh we have we had one one person the last time we did like a pre-order thing where we did perks like this bought it but then was like i don't really care just he's just like here's the money and we're like oh okay cool like <laughs> i was like excited to do it it's like we got lots of riffs and stuff and um 
you know, we've we've recorded three albums here at home, so we have the capabilities to do it. But, you know, we figured we just want someone to do the lyrics. And I mean, I would gladly do them as crazy as possible, as long as they're not like, you know, Offensive. too far. Yeah, as long as they're not going to get us canceled or something, you know, besides that, pretty much anything's game. Were there any, when you were writing out what you wanted to do for rewards, were there any that you wrote down that you changed your mind on that you're like, yeah, this may be a little too weird? Well, it, it's funny because we, so like the first time we did a thing like this, um, do you know the band Protest the Hero? Yeah, I've heard Canadian, of them. Canadian band? Um, they had done like a really successful pre-order thing similar to this. And uh, I emailed them to be like, what was it like? Like, how, how did it go? This was pretty early on when, when bands were just starting to do that thing. Um, and they said that like, they warned us to be careful with what you offer because they, they did like a pizza party thing, but like so many people bought it. And then they were like, they just had a bunch of fans over to their house and ate pizza. And they said it was like, it was fun, but it was like a really awkward experience for them. And they were like, we would never do that again. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, we, we sort of thought about that stuff in advance. We were like, ah, yeah, if there's anything too crazy, I, I think on the last one we did, um, we were like willing to come bring a keg to someone's house and, and like play a show in their basement if they wanted. But, um, I don't think we ever even did that. So we're just like, whatever, we'll leave it out this time. You have some stretch goals. If you reach in excess of what your funding goal was, uh, there's a CD upgrade and a vinyl upgrade that includes extra music. So what can fans expect in this bonus music beyond the regular album? Yeah. So when we did the, uh, the singles during COVID, we released uh, two of them, Death Wish and Strange Love. And there's also another one that we didn't release. So we have an unreleased one from that. And then and then we'll probably, if, if we can, I think um, with the vinyl upgrade, if we put the bonus tracks on, it'll be too much. It'll be too long for the vinyl. So we'd have to do the double vinyl. That's why if we get to that, we can do the double vinyl with the uh, bonus tracks and every extra artwork, all that stuff. So... Um, yeah. And then, um, our, our final stretch goal is to re-record, well, not re-record, but remix it as a synthwave album. So one of the songs on the album is like heavily synth wavy. We, we just got in the studio and we're like, what if we did this? And it was just like, it, it sounded so sick. So we we're like, okay, let's do it. Um, but that got us thinking like, man, I'm, some of these other songs might be good contenders for a, a sort of remix or collaboration type thing. And, the, and, and all of us really love like synthwave, uh, you know, like Dance with the Dead and stuff like that. It's, uh, so, um, yeah, we were hoping like, man, if we could hit that, that'd be really cool. That's definitely a stretch for us, like 50,000 is a lot, but um, yeah, you never know. I, would you consider extending the deadline? I mean, is as we speak, it's 14 days. Probably by the time people see this particular interview, it would probably be one day. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe. I'm not sure how that works. I think Kickstarter is a little like, um, I think they got a lot of regulations. So that you have to be kind of aware of. And you don't want to be like, you know, do the wrong thing. And they're like, actually, this project's canceled. <laughs> and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> So we'll see. Uh, I mean, we'll look into that. We'll see how it, we'll see how it's going. So you got the song out, the best of the best of the best. Now, uh, when can we expect the next single? Uh, so the next one is coming out on Halloween. We got a a bit of a heavier, sort of more um, that sort of classic heavier striker sound coming on. Uh, yeah, on Halloween. It's a a bit of a spookier song. So. I think people dig it. It'll be it'll fit nicely. <laughs> the album's release date is tentatively scheduled for January nineteenth, twenty twenty four. Uh, any worries about trying to fulfill everything in that time frame? I know I've subscribed to Kickstarter campaigns, and one in particular took over a year beyond the deadline for me to get it. Well, that's crazy. No, no, we'll 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 be fine. I mean, we've done it enough times that we're sort of just like, we have, you know, we've already 
have partners that we've worked with for releasing music and, and printing CDs and especially like with the um, uh, doing like some of the custom things like we've always liked to do the like special edition with the like the foil cover and stuff just something different and um, but yeah the, the it's I was surprised because you hear all this uh, talk about like vinyl taking like so long but we looked at the turnaround times and they're actually not bad so I, it must be just like they fired it they fired the factories back up and they're cranking them out now so it's uh, uh nice for us we don't something you don't have to worry about because that's one thing we thought uh, initially was should we even do the vinyl in there um just because i i would hate to I know it, I hate it myself if I pay for something and then it's like a year later. It's just like, man, that money's tied up in like, you know, the, some pre-order that took way longer than it should have. So uh, it's it's pretty important for us to make sure we don't, you know, or that we hit those deadlines with getting, getting the stuff out to people. It's kind of weird that like big companies and stuff like that, when they take pre-orders and there's a huge delay that they don't take into the psychology of you, uh, waiting for it longer and longer because yeah you know it's coming you paid for it you know it's coming it's eventually coming but the longer you wait you're like you're disinterested now mm -hmm. yeah big time i'm always yeah and i always found it's like you you start to resent it a little bit like i, I had like a pre-order it wasn't it wasn't anything crazy it was just like a hoodie or something like that but i had to like i had to email them after a while because i was like it's been so long like and they're like no it's still coming and it's just like how and it that one was like, I've we've printed plenty of merges. There's no way it's taking this long. Like I don't know what they're doing, but I don't know. Striker had to cancel their summer tour in Europe. Are you guys planning on doing something before the album comes out? Or are you going to wait till after? Uh yeah, we're for touring and stuff. We'll probably wait till 2024. We're just working on booking some stuff right now. So we're going to try and get to the states a couple times and then get back to Europe. Um, yeah, the canceling was just like, it's so expensive, especially in Europe. Like, so for for the band, it's funny because I'm always like thinking about like what it was like when we first booked a tour and, and it was, you know, OK, it's a thousand dollars each for plane tickets to get to Europe. And then and then we go to book flights now and it's like ten thousand dollars for the band. And it's just like, holy. So with that kind of thing, it's like if you don't have like a rock solid tour planned or you know it's just gotta everything's gotta go absolutely perfectly and it was brutal because the summer before that when we played at Vok and we did a tour and it was just absolutely loaded with like problems in, in every way it was just like we got we got fined for having the wrong uh highway sticker in austria we got like chased down by the cops at at the mcdonald's and they're like you have to pay like 500 euro fine and we're just like oh my god it just couldn't get any worse so we we're like god damn um so this time we we just looked at the logistics and we we're just like man we we just can't possibly make this work and and it was too bad because there was a lot of really great festivals and it's like you see some comments sometimes people being like oh they could have come but they decided not to and it's just like it's like it it's like go to Europe or pay your rent for the net. You know, it's like I don't know what you want us to do there. <laughs> Dan, do you work on any other projects besides Striker? Uh no, not really. I've I've talked a lot with friends. You know, you go to the bar and have some beers and and start a band together, and then the next day you're like, "Do we? What are we doing?" And then nothing ever happens. So, um, I think maybe one day I'll I'll do some projects with uh, uh the couple guys from the band who were previous members who were all still friends um we've we've often talked about doing some projects for fun doing maybe like a little bit more on the traditional metal side but uh, uh we'll see one of, one of these days <laughs> so you're not in any other bands because you're not a drummer a drummer on the other hand has six or seven <laughs> at any one time yeah exactly exactly <laughs> Well, those are all the questions I have for you today, Dan. The new Striker album, Ultra Power. It, you have a Kickstarter campaign for it now. It's set for, for release on January 19th, 2024. I like what I hear so far. I'm looking forward to hearing more, and people can head over to your Kickstarter page. We'll we'll drop a link for that, and we'll try to get this 
We'll try to get this interview up in time before the campaign ends. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, man. Thanks for taking the time to speak with KNAC.com.